After a few weeks with the 8GB M1 MacBook Pro, I upgraded to the 16GB model. Now, six months later, I think it was the right move, but I wonder if Apple made a mistake here. So let me tell you about the past six months with the M1 MacBook Pro, what I liked, what I didn't like, and where I think Apple could improve. Let's start with the outside and work our way in. So looking at the form factor, I think this is a great looking laptop. It's thin, it looks sleek, and with a 13 inch display, it's super portable. I'll get to the keyboard functionality in just a minute, but as far as size, it's really comfortable to type on. And my only minor complaint from an ergonomic standpoint is that the edge here is a little bit sharp. Now moving on to the display, from a quality standpoint, I think it's great. It's a 13.3 inch IPS retina display with a maximum brightness of 500 nits, which is brighter than the 400 nits on the MacBook Air. If you use your laptop outside or in areas with a lot of light or with reflections, this added brightness is nice to have. It's also a DCI-P3 display, which is a wider color gamut for more accurate color reproduction. I did use it for photo and video editing, and it's great to know that I can trust what I see, but here's the first opportunity for improvement. If I buy a pro device, I'm doing that because I plan to do pro things on it. I would rather have a larger display, like maybe 15 or 16 inches. And I'm not just talking about photo and video editing. Sure, if I'm editing video, I can never have enough real estate to work with. I want as much width as possible for my timeline, and I want room for a preview window, bins, and an effects window. This is where using the M1 iPad Pro with Sidecar really helps, and I have a video coming out very soon about this setup. But even if I'm doing things like coding or working with spreadsheets or creating presentations, I would still prefer more room to work with. Now, there's always a give and take here, right? Because as the display gets larger, the device becomes less portable. With the MacBook Air, I have no issues using a 13.3 inch display because it's mostly for casual use, but with the Pro, I think a larger display would have been a way to differentiate between the two, and I think it would have justified an increase in price, but we'll get to that later. Now, one thing that was disappointing about this display is the bezels. It's 2021, and I think we could get smaller bezels now. Now, looking at the ports, we're getting two Thunderbolt slash USB 4 ports on the left side. Again, this is where I wish Apple would have done more. To start with, I think having a port on each side would have created a better user experience because it would have been more convenient to charge the laptop regardless of where your outlet was located. Then we get to the fact that we only have two ports. Again, with the MacBook Air, it's not as big a deal because the reality is that the vast majority of casual users, they don't plug anything into their laptop other than a charging cable. The M1 Mac Mini has two Thunderbolt slash USB 4 ports and two USB-A ports. The M1 iMac comes with two Thunderbolt slash USB 4 ports and two USB 3 ports. So I don't understand why Apple made a pro device with only two ports. Now, whether you think they should still be using USB A ports or not, I think a four port MacBook Pro makes a lot of sense because you're targeting a much more demanding user group who's likely to use dongles, a card reader, accessories like a dedicated mouse, which may require a USB receiver, and then one or multiple external SSDs. I end up using a small hub, which adds a couple of ports, an SD and micro SD card slots and it's worked pretty well for me so far. Now let's talk about the keyboard and the trackpad. So when I first got the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro, I said that this was possibly the best keyboard that I've ever used on a laptop. I type a lot. I do research for my videos. I reply to as many of your comments as I can. I'm working on a couple of courses and I send a ton of emails. So a good keyboard is a priority for me. After six months, I have nothing but good things to say about this keyboard. It's plenty big. I like the spacing between each key and it's comfortable to type on even after hours of use. Now the trackpad is the best trackpad that I've used on a laptop. From a quality standpoint, it's the same as the MacBook Air, but this one is even bigger and there's more room to work with. Now to the touch bar. And I know, I know some of you don't like it, but I do. I love the visual representation of each function with an icon. I like that the functionality changes depending on what app I'm using. And I like that it's responding to what I'm actually doing within that specific app. For what I do and how I work, I find that it's a really useful feature. Now next to the touch bar, we find the touch ID button, which has worked flawlessly for me. And it's a super convenient way to authenticate without having to constantly re-enter your password. Now next so let's talk about battery life, which is just crazy good. The 58.2 watt battery hour is rated for 20 hours versus 18 hours on the MacBook Air with its 49.9 watt hour battery. The actual battery life depends, of course, on the tasks you're performing 
and the brightness of the display. Now another difference between the two is the power adapter. So the MacBook Pro comes with a 61 watt power adapter versus a 30 watt adapter on the MacBook Air. Now this is a fantastic laptop when it comes to battery life and I pretty much never worry about it when I'm working remotely. Now moving on to speakers, the MacBook Pro sounds surprisingly good. I'm a little bit spoiled with the new M1 iPad Pro, but for a laptop, these sound quite good. We also have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack if you wanna use wired headphones. And of course you can pair your Bluetooth headphones, which is what I do most of the time. The microphone is pretty good, but it's a little soft, so you'll need to speak up. If you're using it for video calls in a quiet area, it'll definitely work. And here's a sample of the audio. Here's a test of the MacBook Pro microphone. I have it about a foot away from me, just about the distance that I would be typing from. And of course I can look right at the screen because the camera is right above where I would be looking. And the device is centered right in front of me because again, the camera is centered on the device. So hopefully this gives you a pretty good idea of what the MacBook Pro microphone is going to sound like. Now, ultimately, if you want the best audio, a headset or a dedicated microphone are the way to go. And moving on to the camera, well, it's not that great. It's a laptop camera. 720p looks kind of like what you'd expect from an older webcam. And again, I think on the Pro model, Apple could have gone with something like the new 1080p camera that we have on the iMac. Now, if you've gotten value from this video, give it a thumbs up. It lets me know what kind of content you like so that I can make more of it. And I still see that over 90% of you are new viewers. So hit that subscribe button. When it comes to configuration, I would approach the MacBook Pro differently than the MacBook Air. With the MacBook Air, I think your casual user who's using it for browsing the web, email, and web-based applications can probably get by with 256 gigs of internal storage and eight gigs of RAM. If they need more room for apps, upgrade to 512, and if they have 200 bucks to spend on RAM, then they won't regret going up to 16 in the long run. Now with the MacBook Pro, I would definitely upgrade to 16 gigs of RAM, and I would probably recommend one terabyte of internal storage, depending on the apps that you plan on getting. Now, if you're going to do any kind of gaming, again, make sure that you have plenty of internal storage so you don't have to be super selective about what you keep installed. I always recommend supplementing your storage with an inexpensive external SSD, and I tested some of the most popular models on the market with my MacBook Pro. I have a dedicated video showing you how they compare in terms of performance, and spoiler alert, one of them was very close in terms of speed to the internal SSD on the MacBook Pro. Now moving on to performance, this is where I expected the MacBook Pro to excel, not Microsoft. And it sort of does, I guess. You see, we're getting the exact same chip as what we have on the MacBook Air, assuming you opt for the eight core CPU, eight core GPU version. So the main differentiator between the two is the active cooling system on the MacBook Pro. The MacBook Air has no fan, so it's completely silent. The MacBook Pro does have a fan and mostly you wouldn't know it. It almost never turns on and when it does, I have to really put my ear to the laptop in order to hear it. Which is great, but also shows that for the majority of what I do, the MacBook Air would do just fine. When it comes to more resource intensive tasks like video rendering, that's when I can actually hear the fan and where I know that it's keeping my MacBook Pro cooler and operating at peak performance levels. If you compare the M1 MacBook Pro to the MacBook Air and you match up GPU cores, RAM, and internal storage, then the difference in price is 250 bucks. If you plan on using this laptop for the next five to seven year in a professional capacity, then I think the difference in price is worth it. Of course, you have to pay it all up front, but in terms of return on investment, the active cooling system, brighter monitor, and longer battery life will pay off. Remember that I have links in the description to all the products I talked about. Hopefully this video was helpful. Click on my face to subscribe and then watch one of these videos. You know what I always say? Buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.